how that people around them should react to it and whether we need to change the way those systems work. We've been trying to figure out what is the way for people to be kept safe in this country, what already exists and what needs to change. In terms of that Manchester attack, that Manchester bomber, the name, of course, we know now, Salman Abedi, he was British born, he was born and bred in Manchester, he was educated in this country, but we also now know, know he was known to the authorities. Much talk has been made of the government's prevent strategy that aims to stop people becoming terrorists or supporting terrorism. Some in the Muslim community have called it a toxic brand. In fact, that's what a Muslim cleric said to me yesterday in Albert Square in the heart of Manchester. Well, an hour ago, the former Home Secretary, Jackie Smith, told me that the government were right to say that they should be reviewing Prevent, but wrong not to have already done so. Ahmed Patel is a dad of four from Dewsbury. His brother-in-law was the ringleader of the 7-7 bombings, Mohammed Sadiq Khan. He joins me now to reflect on this strategy and, of course, what happened to him and his family. Ahmed, welcome to the programme. Uh, good morning. If I could take you back, first of all, to what happened all those years ago now, mm. but in terms of the 7-7 attacks, when did you first realise and how did you first realise that your brother-in-law was involved? Uh, it was on the morning of the 12th of July on the Tuesday when um, officers and my family came to our door and we were told that the, one of the perpetrators was my brother-in-law. So it was about, I think, five, six days afterwards. And what was your response to that? The first response was absolute complete shock um, because obviously you can't just instantly accept something like that so it was absolutely shock and denial and you had no idea that he was thinking like this involved in any sort of networks like this no nothing absolutely no idea whatsoever you see what you have to realize is he was a brother-in-law so obviously my interactions with him were limited so obviously i wasn't in that position to have you know to be observing him uh, as much as what you know, some people might assume. And it was a strained relationship anyway. It wasn't a very uh, amicable relationship. So this time I spent with him was, was what, he, uh, what, what we might call reluctant time. And obviously because he was married to my sister, I had to uh, spend some time with him. Now that you know what you know, mm -hmm. are there any things about him that start to make sense that he was going to be a perpetrator in this way? Um, Unfortunately, absolutely nothing. The only thing that I noticed and was annoyed about is that he is constantly going away places. He was constantly traveling. He was never at home. And, and where did you think he was going? Well, he would say, I'm going to London, I'm going camping, I'm going with my friends. <clears throat> but he was, he was actually uh, a lot more than what you would, you know, normally see from a marriage. Because if, especially if you're a newlywed, you, you know, you're, you're going to stay by your wife and, uh, you know, by your uh, child. But uh, he was always away. I know you don't want to talk about mm. your sister. You're yeah. here to talk about your experience. Yes. But yes. are you able to say what the impact has been on the family as a whole, having a family member <clears throat> who was the ringleader of the 7-7 mm. attack? Well, one of the unfortunate terms that I've had to deal with is this this term family i mean he wasn't obviously blood relative he was no. it's a, a relation through marriage um the other thing that obviously i've had to deal with is this annoying loss of my own personal self because prior to this you know i was known as the son of my father and now unfortunately i'm known as the brother-in-law of the bomber i mean that's not a label that's not a very nice label that's not a label you want to carry with you for the rest of your life but unfortunately with these things happening i have to introduce myself as that just so that i can communicate with people to have the discussion about terrorism but it's not a it's not a pleasant label to have you decided to speak out though in september mm -hmm. yes because you feared another attack yes. in britain yeah it's happened twice now. I mean, Westminster mm. Mm. and Manchester, very different attacks in in way, but similar in what ideology we believe to have driven them. Mm. How do you feel about what's happened? What was your reaction when you heard about Monday? To be honest, now I've come up, I've come to a point now. I'm just completely, totally, utterly fed up. I've had enough. I mean, this is why I contacted you and I've and I've posted things on my blog. I think the anger's gone on my. The anger might possibly come through today, and the anger actually shows on my blog. Um, I've had enough, seriously. I've just absolutely, totally had enough. Um, and, I, and I'll be vocal about it. I've, I've had enough with the uh, whole anti-prevent brigade. I've had enough of them. I've, e I've been e emailing them 
for well months or maybe a couple of years as to you know why they have that opinion i mean let's go to some of the terminology that the so you're talking when you say the anti-prevent mm. brigade mm. you're talking about those in the muslim community that yes, say specifically the, from the muslim community of which you are a member and yes you, you yes. are obviously within your own community known within your own community yes. but this when you say the anti-prevent brigade yes. you're talking about muslims who feel this isolates them and say it stops freedom no, of speech no i think that's ridiculous i disagree with that look in the end we we all have our own brains we all have our own intelligence we all have access to our own books internet uh, research we should make up our own minds we shouldn't allow one two three organizations or individuals to be dictating to us no, how and how it's not up to it's not up to those organizations those people to tell us to follow prevent or not follow prevent first of all they're not community leaders they're not community spokesmen though they might um portray themselves as that um they might have the louder voice but uh, i disagree and i i know plenty more that disagree with me so why do you think so many Muslims are speaking out against Prevent? Uh, simply because these these organisations and individuals, they go uh, on tours all around uh, the UK in mosques and community centres and they uh, push these certain words. I mean, the one word that I actually find funny because anybody who has a dictionary will know that the one term that is used constantly by them is spying. Now, spying, spying means to watch somebody covertly. In other words, a person who is being watched, he doesn't know he's being watched. Now, prevent is a safeguarding duty. It, it, it's something that's out there in the public. We all know about it. So how can you call um, prevent spying? Do you, think, do you think prevent has been effective? Uh, I have I have been told, and I have um, uh, associates who work in Prevent. They have they've actually told me that 25% of referrals in uh, Yorkshire um, uh, to Prevent are from the far right, and there are many many uh, incidents and uh, books and reports that I have read of very very positive stories that have come out from people who work in Prevent in London. Uh, uh, families matter. Um, Hanif Kadid in London, who's written an excellent book. There are many, many. There are many, many others who are pro Prevent, who, who already work in Prevent, and we know that it's, it's effective. But do I, you I, think? Do you think Prevent could have stopped your brother-in-law from committing the seven seven bombing? Well, you see, the thing is, the thing with hind, things like hindsight and hypothesizing is problematic because it's a discussion that really can't exist now because we're talking something twelve years ago. Of course, but I'm, I'm trying to understand mm. could. Could he have been stopped? I mean, I watched the video mm. of him online yes. that he yeah. posted, mm. which was very odd. It had, he had his child on his knee mm. and he was saying goodbye to his yes. child. Yes. With, I understand, I think your sister actually filming it. But exactly. In, it, but, mm. you know, that's a, that's a highly unusual film exactly. to actually see somebody doing that. Yeah. What, how could you? How could you have got through to him? How could have anybody got through to him to stop him from as he believes it, becoming a martyr, as we see mm. it, being a suicide bomber. Well, I think, see, even if the same attitude exists now within some youngsters where they're angry with foreign policy, but obviously now going on to the things that are happening now, if there's a youngster out there who's angry at foreign policy, well, prevent, prevent or even individuals, so I don't actually work for prevent and nobody's telling me to promote prevent, I'm here on my own behalf, is you actually have to tell the youngsters of the UK that, listen, all those nasty things that are happening in the Middle East, that's foreign policy, foreign politics, where you as a youngster, as a father or, or as a parent, um, you focus on your education. Yeah, Citizen, in the UK, we cannot, we, we cannot uh, stop world events happening. We are not elder statesmen. We do not command you know, armies saying, and influence. What you're saying there, which is really mm. interesting, on, yes. is you're talking about parenting. Yes, parenting, yes. Okay. All parenting so we're talking about absolutely. prevent, we're talking about parenting. Yes. And what about, what do you make when people say, and what's your answer, mm. of whether the Muslim community itself has done enough to address those with extreme views within it? I, I, I would say that the Muslim community has obviously done some, but it could have done more and it should have done more. And it should be doing more now? And it should be doing more now. And Who and, should be doing more? Uh, this actually has to come from the mosques. And the reason why I say it has to come from the mosque is I'm going to break down the logic. Now, we've just had a, a very nasty terrorist attack. Um, and who has been affected? The first people that are either affected is the mosques, uh, obviously Muslims, uh, after the victims in Manchester, and it's Islam, right? So you would think that because Islam is smeared because of a terrorist attack, that Islam and Muslims and mosques would be at the forefront of prevent because the first the first reaction the first hate or hate crimes whether and obviously it, there is anger in people uh, there is a reaction and it's legitimate anger it's legitimate reaction i mean i i'm not going to just sit here and just 
uh, use terms like Islamophobia because I even disagree with the term is like Islamophobia. I, I believe it's used to silence debate and argument. There are legitimate concerns in the people of the UK, in the people of the world. You have to look at it logically that if he, if an individual commits an act of terrorism and he is a Muslim, if it happens once, it's once. If it happens twice, two, three times. Now, if you get to something what you might term as a trend, then... You cannot blame the people of the UK to think, oh my God. It's like, for example, if... So, what, so when you say, I understand, so you find, mm, it's very yes. interesting to me, you find the mm. term Islamophobia unhelpful, it yeah, stops people yes. talking about it. I disagree. It. And you say there is a trend for, for, for Muslims or so-called Muslims carrying out these acts of terror. No, and you can, un the, and you no, can understand... This, I, I will call them as a Muslim. I don't want to go the apologetic way and say he's not a Muslim. He's a Muslim. You have to acknowledge that uh, these so what, individuals, they are still a Muslim and it's a great crime, but it's still a Muslim, you know. But it, what specifically would you hmm. like to see the Muslim community, the leaders, the imams, the mosques do in Britain yes. that they're not doing already? Well, the mosques and imams have to be the most vocal right and to decide themselves whether they want to support prevent or not not rely on organizations that come out with scary words and um use you know very very nasty terms like oh it's a war on islam i mean can we imagine that if you say to a 6 15 16 20 year old angry young muslim that oh brother oh brother and this is the language that so they you've got use. to you've got to change that language ahmed patel yes. stay with me for just yes. a moment i have to cross now to to hear live from prime minister theresa may who's giving a statement on the latest on this investigation before we went over to hear from Theresa May, a live update there on the threat level, which remains at critical, and then heard from Fiona with regards to the Queen arriving in Manchester. I was talking to Ahmed Patel. His brother-in-law was the ringleader of the 7-7 seven, seven bombings. His name, Mohammed Sadiq Khan, I'm sure you remember. In terms of what we could learn from that and how to move forward, Ahmed was in the process of telling me how he believes mosques need to be doing more and that he agrees very much with the PREVENT programme as a Muslim and as a Muslim as part of a community. Ahmed, I'm sorry we got interrupted there, uh, news events taking course, over. Yeah. Um, Ahmed, if I could just ask you then, in terms of sort of in conclusion, really, you were mm. talking about what you want to see from mosques. Mm. A, a couple of questions. Do you get attacked for having these views as a Muslim, for being outspoken like this by others in your community? How does it go down? Well, I, well, I don't actually get attacked verbally or physically, but I get ignored. Um, I'm kind of no-platformed. I don't have any much of a say. Because people just don't want to hear this? Yes. They would rather hear the anti-prevent and uh, invite them over to the community centres and um, have tea with them. And somebody like myself who has been through such a massive experience is basically ignored. And does it affect your children and, and their lives? Well, what we do is, I say to them, listen, your dad's doing his bit, I'm online, um, I email people, I've got my blog, I talk to other people, like-minded people. So once you talk to like-minded people and you know there's people out there who agree with you, then you just communicate with them. I, I've, I've read that you feel that, that some Muslims have a sort of victim mentality. Yes. You still believe that? No, the victim mentality is... It's it's a form of, I think, manipulation when, once again, individuals or organizations are constantly going about affairs in, in Muslim lands. And this terminology, I mean, this is why I'm talking about terminology today, uh, affairs in Muslim lands versus the West. I mean, the, the West... I, I am the West. I live in the West. What is this about Muslim lands versus the West? None of us live, are living in Muslim lands. All of us in the UK, we are living in the UK. We have been living peacefully for years and we are doing... And this rhetoric that all oh, the Muslim lands are being uh, bombarded. And yet, look, everybody can see this happening in the news. You don't have to go about it go on about it all the time because obviously it affects the mind. That's why in my home, believe it or not, over the past 10, 15 years, we hardly have a, we hardly ever watched the news because my just my children they just focus on the education. But when you have people coming over on events and after event and event, then they come and say like, oh, this happened in Palestine and this happened in Syria and this is happening there. One of the things that happens when you what I've noticed the trend in our community is if you become an activist and you constantly talk about foreign events, foreign policy, you become very popular. You're a brother, you, or you're one of the community because you're speaking the truth. But but the truth is that we all care. I care. We all care about what's happening in. Uh, in these so-called Muslim lands, and they're not really Muslim lands, and, and so this type of terminology is constantly used to to create this this group mentality, this clique, and this is this is the problem that so it, it does create the an, 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 us and them mentality. And let me just ask then: mm. you said you were utterly fed up when fed you up. heard I'm fed up. about the attack on yes. Monday night. I, was, I wouldn't be here. 
and you're angry. I can hear you're angry. Do you this, that, this anger that I have been carrying for years? I have I have to control it. But I actually you, have to control it. But do you feel that the only way we can, you know, get rid of this from from our society mm. is if you, as you say, the community, the Muslim community, is the do language. More. The problem is the language, the rhetoric that the more prominent organisations constantly use. Is that language that you're is problematic? About, are you talking about Muslim organisations? Yes, Muslim so organisations. Because you see, when when you use this kind of language to people. It, it, it creates a bond, it creates brotherhood, obviously called Ummah. Now, but we already know you do not need to be constantly going on about it all the time because we see on the news all the time what Muslims, organizations, mosques should be telling the youngsters of the UK is to focus on the life in Britain as a good citizen, and that, and as education. And that's what you think needs to change. All yes. the way through today's program, I'm trying to figure out yes. what might need to change. And it's, yes. it's very interesting to hear from you. Thank Arnold you. Well, thank you for giving me this opportunity. At least it lets, lets me maybe sleep tonight because the last past few days I've only been averaging, averaging about four, hour, four hours a night, obviously taking away nothing from the victims in Manchester. Of course. Mm. Ahmed Patel, thank you for mm. talking to me there.